do like a dramatic entrance. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, we are the, in the second part of a two-week introductory uh, series before we go into our seven-week talks on what it means to um, develop our hearts, our heads, and our hands as we become an apprentice of Jesus. Um, last week, Simon started us off, and he looked at the four stages that he identified in the passage. He talked about having people who are onlookers, people who are looking at the faith, just thinking about you know, why people behave in certain ways, but just generally looking more at how Christians are and maybe looking at how Christians express themselves. And then he talks about how people went from being an onlooker to an inquirer, and an inquirer being somebody who is asking questions, somebody who is thinking a lot more about the faith, maybe someone you might find on Alpha, somebody you might be engaging with at work or in your family who wants to know more about the faith. And then he talks about how there's a point where somebody becomes a believer, somebody who commits their life to Jesus, somebody who starts to walk with him. But he, he also said that in this process of being a believer, we also become a, or an apprentice. We become an apprentice. We become somebody who becomes committed to becoming like Jesus, to knowing his ways and to making his ways known. Jesus' call was to become a disciple. But in our missional community this week, we were talking about Simon's talk, and we were saying that Jesus obviously was in the crowd, and he was ministering and living out his life, and people could physically look at Jesus, couldn't they? People could look at his ways, the ways he, he just lived out his life, the way he ministered. They could physically see that and praise God and marvel at his works. But what about today? Is Jesus walking in our midst? Where is Jesus today? In your hearts, in your lives. Jesus is working in you today. So when, G when people look, the onlookers look at you, they are looking at how Jesus is moving and working today through you. Now, I don't know about you, but that's challenging. When people look at me, are they seeing the work of Jesus moving in my life, shaping me and reflecting who he, he is? But... We are called to become Christians, become a disciple, and to become an apprentice of Jesus. That we need information, don't we, as Christians, to grow, but we also need to imitate. We also need to be people who are going to imitate what it means to be like Jesus. Then Simon went on to say that an apprentice is someone who is given to three, developing three areas of their lives. Their heads, which is the renewal of your mind, the way you think, your heart, the rebuilding of your character, and your hands, the revitalizing of our communities. There's those three areas, and we're going to expound on that today, but also over these next few weeks. So why have you got an elastic band? Can you take your elastic band? Can you give it a good old stretch? Can you not stretch it too much? Because if you break it, it completely works against my analogy. <laughs> For an elastic band to be effective, what do you need to do to it? You need to stretch it, don't you? Is it still an elastic band whilst it's not being stretched? Yes. But for it to be effective, it needs to be stretched. And that's a bit like us. You know, for those of us who know Jesus and have committed ourselves to following him, we are Christians, aren't we? We're Christians. We're Christ followers. But to be effective Christians, what do we need to happen? We need to be stretched. And so today we're going to think about what it means to be stretched, what it means for you to be stretched, for each one of us to stretch. And because what stretching does is it increases your capacity. When you stretch an elastic band, it stretches your capacity. It, it stretches the capacity of this to be more useful. And so as we're going through these next few weeks, we're going to think about how we can increase our capacity. Our capacity to love God, to know God, to be transformed by God in who we are, the way we live our lives, but also to transform the world 
by God working in us and through us as he increases our capacity to love those who he'll send us to. But when I say the word stretch, that God wants to stretch you, each one of you will have a different reaction to that. Some of you will go, yes, I want to grow. I want to be stretched. I want to be like Jesus. For some of you, that will feel more like a threat, like, oh, it's going to expose things in me. But we need to remember who is behind the stretcher. This is God. This is our Father who loves us and is for us. A God who's compassionate and kind. He is the one that comes into our lives and wants us to grow for the sake of knowing more life, more of him. And so don't be afraid of being stretched. The times I know looking back over my Christian life, the times that I have grown are the times I've stretched. If, if any of you have ever had a challenging situation where you felt stretched, put your hand up if you identify that. Yeah? For each one of you who identify with that, that moment was a moment of opportunity. You know, where, no matter how hard that situation was, it was a way of understanding God more, a way of under, understanding yourself more, and a way of understanding others more. It's a time of growth. It's an opportunity for God to work in you and to make you more fruitful. But what we need to remember as well with these elastic bands is hopefully yours doesn't look like the person's by your, you. You know, it's unique. The elastic band is unique. And God has made us unique. He's shaped you to react and to grow in him, in who you are. And so we need to be stretched both individually, but also as a church. But when we think about, when you think about maturing, so if I said, how are you maturing as a believer of Jesus and as an apprentice of Jesus today? Yeah, wouldn't it be great if we could just attend more meetings, read more of the Bible, hang out with more Christians, and just become mature? Wouldn't that be great? But for those of you who've been walking with Jesus for, for as long as you have, you know, you'll know there's something much more active about growth. Growth just doesn't happen. If you don't feed a child that's growing up, what will happen to that child? It will get sick. You know, it won't grow up to be a healthy child. And God wants us to be healthy. And so God gives us opportunities to grow that we might become healthy in our faith. You know, that we didn't just get saved to be free from sin. We got saved for purpose. That today, you here are growing for purpose. God has got purpose for you as you grow in Christ. Yes, absolutely. You know, each one of us has been designed to grow. You know, God has got a desire over you that you might be more like Jesus. And, but Simon mentioned this last week. The way that we grow is by growing in our love. The next slide. We'll see how Jesus referred to this. Matthew 22, it says, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. You know, the key to growth is to love. The key to your growth today is love. To love God and to love those to whom he'll send you. That's where you'll grow. This is, and this is where you'll most be stretched as well. You know, if any of you have done any ministry to the poor or anything like that, you know how that stretches you. It stretches your capacity to love. And so this next few weeks is an exciting time for us to think about how we're going to be stretched, how we're going to grow, how we're going to increase our capacity. You know, it's, it's interesting, isn't it, how some, somebody might say to you, how is your spiritual life? How is your spiritual life? Like you have another life. You know, it's a strange thing, isn't it, that Jesus never, never designed us just to be this spiritual thing and then this other stuff was just a, an add-on. You are a spiritual being. God has made you a spiritual being. Your worship, your everyday life, the way you do your life, the way you think, the way you breathe, everything about you is supposed to be our worship. Therefore, it's supposed to be spiritual. And so when we're thinking about ourselves, don't just think about those holy things that you do, that you grow in, the reading your Bible, the prayer. It's who are you? 
What is God making you to be? How are you growing as a whole person? Because that's what Jesus is into. But how does growth happen? If I just said to you right now, I want you to grow. Come on, grow. Grow. What would you do? How would you grow? How would you grow? And this, this is a key for the next few weeks. Because growing is not just about thinking the right things. It's not just about reading the right books. It's not just believing a certain set of beliefs. It's much more than that. I'm going to play you a clip now by a guy called Francis Chan. And I think he captures this very well. It's just a short clip. When I was a kid, we used to play this game called Simon Says. All right, most of us have played that, unless you're really young, because there's no app for it. it, it Simon Says is, uh, you know, you just, Simon Says, pat your head, you know, so, okay, you know, Simon said it. Um, it's just, it was a very simple game, but it's so weird how in the church, Jesus Says is a totally different game. If Jesus says something, you don't have to do it, you just have to memorize it. You, 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 you study it, you memorize You guys, it, it doesn't make any sense. A lot of the things we do, when he tells us to go out and make disciples, and how many people in the, our churches are actually making disciples? But they memorized it. You know, when I tell my daughter, hey, hey, Rach, go clean your room. She doesn't come back to me two hours later and go, I memorized what you said. <laughs> you said, Rach, go clean your room. I can say it in Greek. <laughs> my friends are going to come over and we're going to have a study on what it would look like if I cleaned my room. <laughs> she knows better than that. And so why do we think we're going to come before the judge one day and quote everything that he said and talk about how much we know. But it's, just, it's just this black and white stuff. If I just started with scripture, I'd go, here's what I would do. I'd start making disciples. I don't know about you, but every time I watch that clip, I feel stretched. I do. I genuinely do. Every time I think about what he says, I feel stretched. So true, the true disciple, a true follower of Christ, an apprentice of Jesus is someone that hears the word and puts it into practice, which takes us to today's passage in Luke 6. As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I will show you what they are like. They are like a man building a house who dug down deep and laid the foundation on rock. When a flood came, the torrent struck that house, but it could not be shaken because it was well built. It was well built. What's the opposite then of that? It's hearing God's word and not responding. It's hearing what God has to say about how we live out our lives, about who hears and not respond to that. And so this is the call of Jesus, is our apprenticeship is not just about getting saved. Our apprenticeship is not just about making a decision to follow Jesus and then just waiting for heaven. Our apprenticeship to Jesus is about taking a step every single day to be closer to Jesus, to become more like him, to be transformed by him, and to make him known. You know, it would be great if we could just attend inspiring services on a Sunday morning, connect with a small group, even be involved in ministries in the church, and then we would just grow. But what Jesus has to say is, you will grow when you respond to my word you know maturity just doesn't 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 just happen maturity is a process that we have to engage in and the new testament has a lot to say about your involvement in your maturity that it can be so tempting to say well but the holy spirit is working in me and he's maturing me but the new testament calls you to be an active participant in that we see that in several passages in luke 9 it says then he said to them all Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross. That's an active thing. Colossians 3 says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, 
kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Ephesians 4 says, you were taught with regards to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitudes of your mind and put on your new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. 2 Corinthians says, therefore, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Sounds very active, that, doesn't it? It sounds like we're doing something there with God, partnering with him as the Holy Spirit is moving in our lives. So information in and of itself is not a bad thing. It's great to read your Bible. It's great to be around teachers of the word. It's great to be around others as they share their lives with you about how they're walking with Jesus. That is information. But information should lead us to imitate. Information should lead to imitation. It should lead us to want to copy the ways of Jesus. But not just that. Imitation should lead us to innovation. Imitation should lead to innovation. And what innovation is, is when God takes your life, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, he uses your life for his purposes. In your context, whether that's in your family, whether that's in church, whether that's with your neighbours, whoever that is that you're around, that God would take your life and use it for his purposes, that he would innovate with you, that you would be a partner with him as he works through your life. But if we practice living like Jesus, guess what? You end up living and becoming like Jesus. If you practice living like Jesus, you will become like Jesus. That's a guarantee. If you practice the ways of Jesus, we become like Jesus. But this involves a daily posturing. A posture is, can be physical, can't it? A posture can be when you are just bowed down before the Lord. It could be hands out. They could be different postures that we can do before God. But what he's more interested in, not that he's not inter- interested in those things, he absolutely is, but the things he's most interested in is what's happening within you, the posture of your life. And so what I'd like to do is go through three postures just to help us think about this next series and about where we're at when it comes to our head, our hearts, and our hands. And whilst, whilst I'm talking about this, just keep hold of your elastic band. Just keep hold of your elastic band. Think about where God might be stretching you this morning. The first posture is a posture of surrender. You know, surrender is about laying down your life before someone else. The surrender of our hearts is when we lay down our lives before Jesus. Now, that is his call over our lives, that we would lay down our lives before his lordship. You know, that where we recognize that this life is not about us. I don't know about you, but sometimes I forget that. Sometimes, you know, in certain conversations, in things that I do, in certain ways that I behave, suddenly I forget that life isn't about me. It's about him. Can anybody identify with that? No? Um, we, can, we can be self-focused sometimes, can't we, about our needs, our wants, our desires. But God is wanting us to lift our eyes to heaven that we might know what his will is in our lives as we're learning to walk with Jesus. You know, it, surrender is about taking your preferences and laying them at Jesus' feet and says, Lord, not about what I would will, but what you would will in my life. It's a very nice prayer, but when, you, when it hits the road, that's, a, that's challenging, isn't it? Sometimes when we have to choose the way of Jesus over our own way. Our second posture is one of generosity. You know, I find myself in this, but we know that this is culture at large, is that our natural posture can be to take and to hold, not to give away, to build and to keep. This is a counter-cultural living. When we say to God, whatever you give me, I want to be generous with. Whatever that is. Whether that's my money, whether that's my time, whether that's my energy, whether that's my understanding. Whatever that is, Lord, whatever you have given me and shown me, I want to be generous. And what does scripture say about that? Scripture says, freely you have received, freely give. Freely you have received, so freely give. You know, God has shown you compassion. God has shown you kindness. 
God has shown you patience. All the things that God has shown you, he now wants you to take those things and be generous with those to others. You know, what I have in my life does not belong to me. Whatever I have in my life, it's a gift from God that's been entrusted to me for his purposes. You know, whether, whether that's what my intellect, whether, again, it's my money or my time or my energy, whatever God has put into me and given to me, it is a gift that others might be blessed. You know, that for me is a moment of stretch. You know, when I, when I think about that, when I think about what's God put in me and how am I willing to take that and use it for his good and for the good of others. You know, we truly are just a steward. You know, and our prayer really should be, God, let me not be tight-fisted. Let me not be tight-fisted with what you've given me, but let me be open-handed and generous. The third posture is one of engagement. We call this mission. We call this reaching out to others. The natural posture, if we're not careful, is to disengage. It's so easy to disengage, isn't it? It's so easy to go into our homes and shut the door and disengage, disengage from need. So easy. You know, I find myself doing that. Because one of the enemies that we've got in Western culture is comfort. We can enjoy comfort in this home, can't we? In, in this world, sorry. Uh, in our homes. But isn't it amazing that God would take you and take me as he's stretching us to reach out to those who are lost, the least, the lonely, the disenfranchised, those who nobody else thinks about, that we could be those who engages with the others, that we might be people who are generous, who, are, who reach out into other people's lives. But this isn't something you're going to become just overnight. You know, when I hear talks like this, I just go, oh, Lord, you know, yes, I'm not that. I'm not that. But God is good. You know, God takes us from moment to moment to moment to grow us, to increase us, to change our hearts, to increase the way we think that we might become like him. So for me, sometimes this is a day-by-day -day process. Sometimes it's an hour-by-hour -hour process. Sometimes it's a minute-by-minute -minute process. Sometimes I think I've got it nailed and then a thought will come into my head or I'll do a behavior and I'm like, Lord, that's not what you want from me. Lord, change me. Change me from the inside that I might be generous yeah wouldn't it be amazing as a church as people we are the church as we've discussed before that we could live for something that is greater than us let us live for something that is greater than us let us live for God's purposes you know let us be people who embrace the mission that God has got for us as a church and let, oh, hello. And let us embrace those who God would send us to you know whether that's the lost the, the least the lonely <coughs> But it could be the poor, the powerless, the underprivileged, and the persecuted. You know, for each one of us, we will be connected with different things in different ways where we can think about how we can be impacted in this way. But for some of us today, you may be thinking, do you know what, I just don't feel this today. Or there are some days that I just don't feel it. Do you know what a great prayer is when you feel like that? Is, Lord, help me want to want you. Help me to want to want you. Lord, help me to love loving you. Because this has to come from God alone, doesn't it? You know, we love because God first loved us. But this, this has to be a work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. You know, those moments when I just don't feel it, I need to draw near to Jesus. And I need to ask him that he would stir that in my heart, in my life. And I know behind that prayer is a God who is for me, not against me. A God that loves me. A God who wants me to grow because he cares for me. And so let's be a people who are, are quick to respond to the grace of God in our lives. You know, God, God is going to use each one of us as we move forward in our, our lives and already has done. But he has so much more to do as we journey with him. So these next seven weeks, we're going to go on this journey together. We're going to journey in groups. You know, our hope is that each one of you is already in a group whether that's a missional community or whether that is a small group. And for those of you who are not, like Rob said earlier, if you're not in a small group, um, please uh, speak to one of us if you'd like to be in a group where we can plug you in and we can get you doing this journey, even if it's just for this next seven weeks that we might do uh, this growing together. 
Um, uh, but we're going to use a specific tool uh, to do this. It's an online tool. It's a tool that we've come across. It's actually been developed by a, a guy in the Church of England. And it's a tool that's going to help us identify areas where we can grow, where we can be stretched. Because sometimes we don't see what we don't see. We, we, it's just helpful to go through a process of seeing ourselves in a different way. And this tool is going to help you do that. It's going to help you identify areas where we can grow. It's also going to identify areas in which you're strong, in which you're already flourishing. And, and they're going to be areas that you can just thank God for. Uh, when it comes to three areas, your head, your heart, and your hands. And when you complete this tool, you might find that there are just some areas that you're just excelling in, and we just thank God for that. But there'll be areas as well that God can continue to stretch you. Uh, because apprenticeship is a process. Why is it important for us to know where we are currently? If we just go to the next slide. Have any of you ever tried to plan a journey not knowing where you are? <laughs> it doesn't get you very far, does it? It doesn't get you very far. To start planning a journey, you need to know where you are. I do. I need to know where I am right now to know how to get to the destination that I want to get to. And it's like that with our spiritual lives. You know, if we want to think about growing, we need to just take stock of where we're at. And that's not so we should feel bad about ourselves. That's so we can see opportunity. Opportunity that God can use us and stretch us and shape us and mold us to become like him, to be more, effect more effective and to be more fruitful. And so that's the journey we're going to go on. So on the back of your notice sheet, if you just grab your notice sheet, you will see some instructions for how to engage with the tool. So like I said, it's an online tool. And what will happen is you will go online and you will complete a set of questions, which I'll show you in a minute. Now, for some of you, you will be very IT literate and approaching a computer does not fill you with fear. And so just go ahead, take those instructions, fill in the questions, which I'll, again, explain in a minute how you do that. And at the end of that, there will be some results. Now, for some of you, you're going to need some more instructions than you've got currently um, on the back of that sheet. Um, but also, you're just going to need some more help. So at 1 o'clock today, for those of you who receive the weekly email, <laughs> you will receive a little sheet that looks like this. And this will give you the instructions for filling in those questions online. Now, for those of you who get this and you think, no, still don't get it. I just don't get it. I need more help. If you pop into church, there, are, there is a step-by-step -step guide for those really who are not IT literate at all. But for those of you who just are fearful about turning a computer on, and there, there are probably some people here who are just like, ah, I just can't connect with a computer, feel free to pop into church and we will have a computer available for you to fill in this questionnaire. And if you can't do that on your own, there will probably be somebody around who can do that with you. You may want to do this as a group as well. You might take, um, you might take a night together to look at doing this as a group, and that's absolutely fine. So what, what does it look like? When you go online, you will complete a set of questions. There are 20 questions in total. Question one, for example, says, how much of your day-to-day -day life changes as you think about what it means to live for Jesus? There is a slider. You will go, if, if you don't think about that at all, you don't think about living for Jesus, you go to the far left. If you think about it all the time, that's all you ever think about. You will go to the other side that says, in every way. But for most of us, it probably will be somewhere in between. So you move the slider to reflect that. You go through 20 questions... And at the end of those questions, you will be given a shape. Let me show you a shape on the next slide here. So this was one I just put together. And after doing the questions, this gave me this particular shape. And this shape has meaning, believe it or not. This shape has meaning. And this will give you um, an indication of where you are strong. Now, bear in mind that we are looking at our head, how we think about God, how our mind is being transformed, how our hearts are being transformed, and how we are reflecting that through what we do. And so this will show where I'm strong and where, I'm got, where I've got opportunities to be stretched, where I've got opportunities to grow. 
Just underneath that, when you complete this online, next slide, please, Joe. You will see your shape. Now, the P, if, you, if your uh, results show you a little red dot right in the middle of, of that plan, you, you pretty much are like Jesus. So if that's you, come and see us because you need to be running the church. <laughs> but for most of us, we are probably going to get a more interesting shape. And that, again, will show you where you are strong and where you have areas to develop, where the Lord can stretch you even more, that his capacity in you would grow. And so this, this is the aim. Now, at the very end of that, there is an opportunity to put in your name and an email address. And what that does is it gives you an opportunity to log back into that site and to look at your results again and to amend your results or, more interestingly, you could go back a few months later, say in a year's time, and look back at what you said about yourself a year ago. And you can reflect on what God has done, how you've grown, how God has stretched you and increased your capacity over that year. Now, what will happen at that point is all those results will come as a whole to church, anonymously. So your names, even though you put your name into the website for your purposes only at your end, so you can log back in, your name does not come to church, but your results do. And what we're able to do as a church is we're able to gather all of those results all together and see our church shape, which I think is really exciting. Yeah, so as a church, we can see out the head, the heart, and the hands, where do we need to be stretched? Where do we need to be investing time as preachers and leaders? that we might help ourselves and encourage you to grow. So just to, just to stress, it's completely anonymous. Your results come through, but your name doesn't. So we have no idea, uh, uh, yeah, we have no idea who is putting what. Now, at the bottom of that as well, when you put your name in, there will be a space to put a church code in. And on this card that you will get, and if you don't have a card, grab one of us after today if you don't get one. And there is a code on the card, and you need to put that code into the website. And it's also on the back of your notice sheet. So if you put that code into the website when you completed your results, it identifies us as a church. We know that, that those results are coming from somebody. Again, we don't know who that is, completely anonymous. It comes through to us, and then we can collate that information. Does that make sense? Yep, great. Yeah, so again, this is about... Not identifying weakness. This is about identifying areas where God can increase your capacity. Because the reason we do this together, the reason we want to encourage you to do this in small groups, is the place you will best grow is in community. I don't know about you, but sometimes I need encouragement. I need people to walk alongside me to say, hey, this is an area I can see the Lord stretching you. Let me pray with you. And I need to be able to say to some people, do you know what, I identify this in myself? I need you to encourage me. I need you to pray for me. But that's best done in community. So I really encourage you, if you're not in a group already, to join a group, even if it's just for this series. But again, we'd encourage you just to be part of a group generally. But the Lord is wanting to stretch us. And so I encourage you to take your elastic band away with you this morning. And just maybe make that a prayer. You know, before you start filling the answers in, I'd encourage you to pray. Just say, Holy Spirit, calm and guide me through this process. See me, show me who I am. Let me see myself as you see me. Show me where I'm strong. Show me where I can be stretched, that I might love you more, that I might love myself and love others more for your sake. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are here with us. Lord, I thank you that as we hold this elastic band in our hands, God, we're reminded, Lord, that you are close to us. Lord, that you are not far off. Jesus, we thank you that we can become like you. That, Lord, as we abide in you, as we dwell in you, as we walk in you, in the spirit, that, Lord, you are going to increase our capacity to know you. 
Lord, I pray that you would guide us over this next few weeks, that, Lord, our desire would grow to want to love you, to want to know you. God, I pray for a hunger to fill our hearts. Lord, let us be a people who are responsive to your word, that, Jesus, that we might be like you. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your kindness and your mercy. Lord, we thank you that your mercies are new every day towards us. So, Lord, we surrender to you. In Jesus' name. Amen.